I value all of my citizens, all sovereigns. I will support you to the last breath that I have. And I don't plan on expending anybody if I can help it. We have a couple of mottos in our units that are standard that everybody must hold by. Number one, you're only as fast as your slowest man. Number two, we leave nobody behind. We either hang, hang together or we most assuredly hang separately. Which comes right back to the full circle. Forgive me, please. There will be no more Wacos. If we have to come across the country to help you, we will. It'll be a surprise. We don't need to go into details. <laughs> also remember, it doesn't mean we can send the whole army of Michigan against them. But as I saw in the other event, we didn't need the whole army. We just needed some good men. And again, patience will prevail. And I'll discuss that with people later, too. Patience is the key to all actions that are taking place. And all actions in the future to preserve your strength. It takes a long time to grow a patriot, by the way, doesn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. We value every one of our human lives. For instance, something I don't want to hear that I remember came out of the Civil War and World War One too. Oh my God, they're going to take my leg. They're going to take my arm. If the doctor told me today, right now, that that arm had to go, I'd ask the doctor if he wanted me to hold the saw. We will find, we will not abandon you. We will find a way to preserve you. We will help you. You will go on living. The most important thing is that this continues to function, right here. This is priceless. The walking, breathing, living patriots of this nation are the strength of the country right now. Amen. Amen. That's the bottom line. We possess physically the history of the nation right here. Why is it they want euthanasia? So that those of you who are older cannot tell those that are younger the lies that you see in the history books. So that when Orwell takes over, when 1984 comes to pass in fruition, put in total, the older people who lived the events will not be around to argue that they've rewritten the events. See how that works? You can't suffer to have the older parts of the population around. You can't afford to have them there. Not if the New World Order has its way. And what about the very young? Well, after all, those that they consider useful through their quote-unquote breeding programs will be allowed to survive, but a lot of your children won't. One of the things that a Rockefeller clone set out in the Dakotas during one of the eco-conferences, and these are his words, when they get rid of the cannon fodder, you know, 75% of the American people, then they were going to bring into this nation the people that they wanted, and they would be victorious. Anybody here think they're in the top 25% to be kept? I hope not. Not in their guidelines, right. And nor do I want to be on their list. You're right. That's very important to remember, too. In looking at what's happening in this country with regard to eroding this or trying to cover it, because it can't destroy it, what they'll do is mask it, make you believe that it doesn't have authority or power. Well, in doing that, they're creating more and more new laws that have the color of law, but not the substance of law. And that's, for instance, these latest passages that we're seeing about, for instance, teaching uh, your faith, mentioning God in public, being a Christian and espousing to be a Christian in public would be a felony. Obviously, in school, we know that's already happened, and I've described it the best way, and if you want to use this as a tool, do it. It used to be, and traditionally has been, God, family, country. That's a tripod. You all know that the strongest geometric figure is what? A tripod. So the enemy wasn't stupid, and in the many years that they've been running at us time and again, they've eroded one element or the other and finally got a leg to topple us. We all know what happened to God in school. We all know what, what has happened to the preaching morality and the training and the teaching of proper morality with regard to how we treat our human beings, our fellow citizens. And with regard to family, well, need I say more? I think it's very obvious how they've attacked that. Any one of these legs collapsing, the whole structure falls. But they are also mutually supportive. And as long as, old, as the teachings are there, and as long as the grandparents are there, and the parents are there, and the morals are there, it will persevere. 
That's another reason we're going to need all you gray-haired people that are out there, absolutely, no matter what, is because traditionally, when I'm away, if I don't come back, and I hate to put the burden on you, but it's got to be there, Grandma and Grandpa are the ones who can be the next iron rod when we're gone. You're going to have to take over for us to make sure that the torch is passed. I say this also of our women here who are here tonight and also our women at home. We may not come back. We'd like to, but we also understand the cost and the value of what we're fighting for. So you had better make sure that when we leave, you make our expenditure worthwhile. If you cherish what we've done because we're willing to expend ourselves if need be, then you get to hold the torch too and you get to run with it the rest of the way. I'm counting on you to do that. Now, I guess we carried on for a bit. What I'd like to do is, because there's a lot of people here questioning answers, because I know there's always something somebody's asking and wants to ask that I usually don't cover, just go ahead and raise your hand. We can go ahead. Anybody? Yes. Do you feel that they hit us from all sides with the UN, like under a FEMA action or something? I mean, with these... You want troops in the states or around our country at this point? Yes. Do you think they start in our cities, for instance, or do you think that they may hit us from all different regions, as they call them? Well, the regions, as they're looking at we we're looking at it right now, is they have to go with a lightning action across the country. They have to have a national emergency. They can't afford if, in fact, even when they do this, I do not believe that they will be able to roll fast enough. And we've already had our Lexington with, with Waco and with the Weavers. Concord is next. And we will know by the smoke on the horizon, we're going to know when the time comes and the flames rise, that we are going to have to resist this time no matter what, if we are to cherish and protect this document. Now, as far as where their effectiveness, it will vary depending upon some of the fanatics that they've hired. It will also depend upon their clandestine elements. See, what they would hoped for with all of you, and this is what they did not expect, is organization. They wanted riotous, angry, fairly ignorant people with regard to what was going on so that they could demonstrate the problem and then come in with a solution. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Create the problem, demonstrate the problem, come up with a solution that we otherwise would not have accepted. What has happened is this. We have organized, we are thinking, we are effective, we can fight. And I'm not going to be out in the middle of the street with a rock. I'm going to be downrange with an odd six at 400 yards. And I know I'm going to hit it. Ma, you know, my dad didn't train no fool. And so for that reason, we're in the right place at the right time. We are in a mad dash for the finish line, by the way. I can't stress that enough. Now, we don't have to be 100 yards ahead. We only have to be three paces ahead of everything that they do. Now, one way or another, you win. And in this case, we've already had a head start. As you all know, with a lot of the work that we did, its mission was to get out to as many people as possible with no communications mechanism. You'll notice we didn't use the media. I wasn't worried about the media. We know fact of the matter, word of mouth is the best communications mechanism amongst the patriots. And the, the tapes you've seen have been all over not only the United States, but they've been all over the world. We know for a fact that a doctor up in uh, in Canada did 30,000 copies of American Peril himself, had them commercially made, sent them to New Zealand, Australia, Asia, Europe, parts of Canada, and even some parts of the United States. He did it all himself, paid for it with his own money. What do you think that did to the system? And I know, I don't have to hear it, I know everybody made copies of something, didn't they? <laughs> oh yes, you'd better have done that, or I'll come over with a stick and beat you. Because that's what we wanted to see. We, we wanted to see that happen. Because by doing that, we made it, we put a question mark in people's minds. You didn't have to believe everything at that time. But all of you who've seen American Peril understand that it's now almost really a history book. It's not a, gee, they're going to do it. American Peril is already a year plus old, and it actually is in motion now. You're seeing it. So with that in mind, then you have to ask yourself, where do they go next? Well, we all know where it goes next. It's just a matter of whether or not they panic at a particular time and how they spring. And they are panicking. 
They're playing as many cards to create confusion as they possibly can. Somalia, Yugoslavia, Korea, White Watergate. Yeah. Take your pick with all this stuff. It's a jumble. That's right. Gary Gitt. That was. That really was. You know what? It's like, if you remember what I said, it's a coordinated effort just like when they went into Kuwait, when, the, when, the, when Iraq invaded Kuwait for three days in the national news in headlines this tall, Zsa, Zsa Gabor slaps a cop. That is not national news, but that is a way to keep you busy watching this while they go for the short yeah, right. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. Yeah. <laughs> and now again we see it with, uh, I mean after all, you all know the most important piece of news on the, in the country is some man getting his private parts cut off, right? Um, yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> three solid weeks of that. When that was done, three solid plus weeks of the Kerrigan situation. And we we're from Detroit, so we had it ugh, right in our face. Trust us. The most, I mean, the first question you just had to ask was, what will this do to the world of figure skating? <laughs> <laughs> You're in the middle of a summer environment here. Anybody here go figure skating today? <laughs> You're down in Florida. Can okay. I ask you something, please, Mark? Yes. Uh, in the United States, right, how many think we have organized members in the militia in the United States between different states? Between all the different groups? Yes, sir. I would guesstimate a minimum, an absolute, absolute minimum of probably three million to maybe four. Four million? Yes. That's that's effective. You've got to remember a few things that are in place. The different elements that are still around from uh, the older days that actually they passed on the flag. The Minutemen are still alive. They're the still Minutemen. around. I used to bought the Minutemen back in the 60s. Okay. The Minutemen are still there, and a lot of their, a lot of their children have passed on, are, are now of age. You're seeing Sons of Liberty. You're seeing a series of other traditional militia formations, including home guards, which are in 17 states of the Union, that are in place still. In fact, ours, we've been trying, we were trying to find out for the last two or three years who was in charge of, of uh, Michigan's home guard. In the last month, one of their officers came to one of our people and told, related a story. The home guard consists of 10,000 people who are not regular army, it's all volunteer and they are equipped from hand-me-down equipment that came from the uh, uh, PDOs, property disposition offices, or they come from existing supplies. Well, about a month ago, the state had the Fed commanded to take everything that the state militia had and ship it to Indianapolis. Now, wait a minute. Why would they do that? Because it was a home guard unit. It's not a combat unit. Its mission is to stay inside Michigan. Well, this isn't just happening in one part of the country. They're trying to do this all over the United States because they perceive the American people to be the threat to the New World Order. Not a foreign power, not foreign nationals, not some invader. The American people are perceived to be the greatest threat to what they are going to do to this country. And so that's how they've targeted us. And many good officers, by the way, and this is the other thing I'll, I'll point out, the minimal is because I do believe that overall, between the unorganized and organized general militia, that we probably have a total of maybe eight million. Eight million? Uh, it could be that high, and that we have to allow for the fact that you are only one of many nets, and I don't even want to know where they all are. Well, I'll say this: I've had many good men come up to me, and we've had one point of contact in the last year. And all they said is, "We will know when the time comes." Thank you for being there. I don't want to know who they are. But I know some have offered regiments, some have offered battalions, some have brigades. We know that some of the formations, beyond a shadow of doubt, are in excess of 5,000 men per unit. We have our own artillery. We have armor. We have aircraft. So we are not you know, without resources. How they're used is important, and they have to be used preciously and carefully. We can't sacrifice them. That's very important. Yes. Well, of all of the guardsmen that we've had that have either sat in my home or have been to meetings or they've also met in the field, most have said, although there's a few that are still in a quandary, some of them walked away with, in brain fart, because when they realize that all you were out there, they realize it's not going to be a cakewalk. But I, of, of them, 99% have said this. Whoever it is that gives them the order to shoot American people, they shall turn and kill them first. Yeah. 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 The, reason, the 
the reason is this, though, and that's why I'm ta- that's why I'll stress this again tonight. The people who are talking about live amongst you. The way I point it to them is this: You want to shoot mom and dad? You want to go down and shoot your uncle or your cousin? Are you willing to do that? Are you that much of a traitor to this nation that you are going to do that? That's what the UN is for. But you see, they still need more bulk and cannon fodder. They need scouts and they need they need quizlings. Remember that term? Yeah. They need quizlings because they must have the facade of legality. And that facade will be brushed away soon enough, by the way, because they eventually they'll realize. That's why I say there are two stages also to this war. In the first stage, it will make it appear to be an internal conflict. As more of the American people realize and perceive the threat, a lot of the sunshine patriots will come along for the ride after you've done a lot of the work. But when that when that as more of the American people realize and perceive the threat, a lot of the sunshine patriots will come along for the ride after you've done a lot of the work. But when that when that happens, the New World Order will realize that if it does not go full tilt and if it does not wage total war against the American people, then it shall it shall fall forever. We will be able to stop it for this generation and we will be effectively able to educate and structure a defense for future generations again and we shall openly declare the threat. They know this and that's a very testy time for them. Yes. Oh, I have, a, I have a doctor in my yard every day in the airport right next to me. And he's saying that it's a company called Tech Fry. They're in training by Tech Tech Fry. Are you familiar with that? No. Okay. <laughs> Man, they use black helicopters. They've been out here already. Yep. Oh, here, wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, way in the back, and then you next. Yeah. Have you seen any marking on the intersections and back of signs? Have you seen any on your trip down here? We straight down towards the. This area. As, a matter, as, a, as a matter of fact, we saw some, and I, re, I received some pictures which we haven't gone completely over yet, that should be back up in the office by the time we get back up north. Um, one thing we did see that was interesting on the way down were a series of light dots on overpasses or over and, uh, and signs that over, over, overhung the expressway <laughs> from the sides that could not be seen, and head on they were about the size probably of my finger, and they were like domino sets. Domino markings, in groups of two, four, and five, with four dots at the outer points and a dot in the middle. It's code. That's obviously a code, and it marks a route. Yes, sir. Um, in different parts of the country, we're seeing different techniques used with regard to what markers are involved. Where we are, we got the colored rectangles you're all familiar with and some of you have even seen pictures of. <laughs> then we had the numbers show up next to them, and the numbers rate an area, rate a, rate a target that's near the sign. That's very obvious once you start to travel 60 or 70 miles of a route. A 0 or a 1 denote a country road intersection. A 2, 3, or 4 usually denote a residence or an apartment complex. Anything higher up to just below a 10 or a 10 usually are some prioritized targets a little bigger like a small farm. Large farms, green elevators, and factories are 11 through 13. So they've already prioritized what are considered to be important objectives and what are low objectives. Also, if they're using the route markers as a form of contact for individuals who do not speak very good English and are not familiar with the road net, it is very important that they have a simple system for identification. And by being able to give a mile marker number, which are these new blue ones, you might have seen some of them. They're not the green ones everybody's familiar with, but they're blue. And they're about, again, about this large. They are a white trim, blue marker, and they have a, a map compass symbol next to them, north, south, east, west. These routes earmark the particular area, the route. Then you have, of course, the colored marker, the red route. So it's mile marker with direction, color, and a number, which also gives them a point reference on the map. This assists the pilot. In my, I'm personally, I'm sure that this is how it will work because... Too many heavy lift helicopters are involved in these operations. They brought out of mothballs a lot of big helicopters. A lot of CH-47s, a lot of CH-54s and 53s. And almost every one of them now are flat black, no markings, no ID, and impossible to signature. What their purpose is, once they transport troops in, they can bring prisoners out. 
And it's very simple. If you've seen the plastic handcuffs, cheap as cheap can be, wad them up with the handcuffs, fill up a five-ton truck when the time comes. Comrade Strelenko takes his red smoke, picks up the phone. I have five truckloads full. Biomarker 14 North, red route, one. Helicopter lands. Prisoners get taken over to the chopper. You run your shackle irons through there, and it doesn't need to be nothing more than the thickness of a handcuff chain. And you run it through the legging points and the grounding points inside the helicopter on the floor. The prisoners can't go anywhere, and once they're in the air, it's impossible for them to be repatriated. They can be taken right to a detention area, dropped right inside it, disgorged, sorted, and the chopper can go on to perform another mission. Now, in addition to this, something we just recently found out, which is becoming very obvious, is that uh, we have a rating system, uh, black, gray, and white for prisoners. Black prisoners would be such as all of us, I think, here. Obviously, patriots, aggressive, or perhaps a threat to New World Order operations on the ground, wherever they occupy. Gray are individuals that are questionable. They may be detained for a period of time right there on the site and then would be released or, or, or it would be determined by an interrogator whether or not they're taken on with the black rated prisoners. White prisoners would be stopped, interrogated, and released because they're either friendly or they're non, they're non patriotic. They're, in other words, they're neutral. They'll become the Quislings later. So they already have a rating system and that's been positively identified and we have seen several examples of that. Now mostly they've been training in New York with this system already and we believe they've also been training in other sites. We have many, many of the detention sites now photographed. Not just suspecting where they are and knowing the approximate area, but we have many people, patriots like yourself, who've gotten up, went out, and have identified the sites. Not just the larger complexes, but many of the first or first level holding areas on the boondocks. In our area, we have two or three new ones that are fairly large. They're obviously going up. In Michigan, for instance, as opposed to Florida, where we've seen some markers in different locations, but not all routes, the ones that we have seen are up uh, above Tampa, on a secondary on the secondary road. That I think if we open up the map, we can give you the we can give you the road coordinates. Yes. Well, what I would do is this: you might think about going out at night, taking your cold chisel and knocking off the bent over bolts that are there. Yeah. <laughs> Run a new carriage bolt through and put a thumb nut on it. Down the road, you might want that convoy to go somewhere else. And when it goes where it's supposed to, boom, 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 all of a sudden you got five five-ton trucks, lots of rifles, and you've, you've liberated a lot of prisoners. Then you take the thumb nuts and you put the route back together, and wherever somebody's looking for that convoy, it isn't. You see? So you don't necessarily want to destroy it. Now, what we found is this. Well, thank you. There's a couple interesting things here. Number one, a lot of the markers do not seem to be all that reflective, which was a mystery to a lot of people. We do believe that they are fully infrared sens uh, sensitive and probably accumulate heat during the day and can be seen with good night vision. In fact, it's been tested in some areas that's true. Down in Texas, they took large magnets at night and went up to where the markers were and they found that in the dark, when they brought the magnet up to it, the magnet activated some form of some form of sensitive sensitivity device on the material, and it glowed. So, with an electromagnetic field, they can be activated. Why is a good question. That makes them that make them illuminate on their own, perhaps. Uh, it makes it easier to identify, obviously. So, as far as how the technology is based, we don't know everything because on this. In the Carolinas a series of coordinates started to show up on intersections. One of the gentlemen who called us identified the coordinates as artillery markers of the type that he used during the Vietnam War as a forward observer. And these, of course, are on military facilities. At first, only one or two intersections were marked. Now all of the counties that, he is, that are near the facility have been gridded with artillery coordinates at each intersection on the backs of the signs, just like the markers. So there's a wide array. There's a wide array. Another one that we've seen, you might want to watch for. The sign markers are about so large, but now they have a series of hold dots, and we don't know what those do. But chances are they activate also, and they glow in the dark, or they can be seen effectively with sensors with a night vision or with infrared. 
It's possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anybody else? Mark. Oh, yes. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, number one. We have our Patriot missiles in Afghanistan. And number two, I heard that we gave a bunch of government surplus to the Seminoles and the Sioux Indians, and then we can find the shit. Where's it at? Well, I'm sure it can be found eventually. Um, what happened that? is, first of all, that down, or what? first of all, it was probably uh, not Pershings, but uh, you're talking about uh, Stingers. Yeah, right. The Stingers. stingers. Right, right. A lot of the Stingers ended up being passive, uh, contrary to the story that they might have pushed. What I think happened with the Stingers is that <clears throat> some of the components were designed to, uh, over a time, break down, and then internally that they were designed to oxidize in different ways. The battery packs are hard to get. They will destroy themselves. Huh? They will destroy themselves on the shelf, perhaps, because the stingers are a threat that everybody said the terrorists will have. Okay. We've had the SAM-7 around now for over 25 years, and yet it has never been admitted that the SAM-7 has knocked down a single jet airliner in history. It's a shoulder-fired missile, just like the uh, Red Eye. <laughs> They're just about as common as popcorn. Every nation has them. So the Stinger's no greater a threat than the others are because they're saving those for the, what they perceive to be the real threats, you know, jet fighters. That's what they're going to engage, destroy, and take out. With regard to... Um, the Army surplus. We Army gave, surplus, okay. We gave it to the Sioux, we gave it to the Seminoles. The Indians, just like other agencies in the government, can do what's called screening. <clears throat> there was a mo an amount of equipment that they were given and uh, authorized to possess that was stored on their properties. It's disappeared. Now, somebody might have shuffled it down the road. Some Patriot mechanisms, so who haven't been, who knows who they might be, might have acquired them, okay? And, or, again, they're there, they just can't be found right away because they're being dispersed by the Indians who have them. The Indian population is organized in many areas, so don't forget them as another entity. They understand, as well as everybody else does, that while they are not in the best of positions, that they're still better off than they would be under the New World Order, <coughs> and that they have some autonomy. They would have no autonomy under the New World Order program. And they'd lose it, right? They'd lose it. And in fact, the Mohawks probably are the best organized in the East. The Sioux Nation as a whole has some militant arms that are well organized. They, they're plus and minus in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. And even here, as you all know, there are different elements in Florida that are probably in existence that Seminole. the Seminoles that we aren't able to get into. And we don't have to. We don't really want to know. Again, compartmentalization. So it's important that we maintain integrity. Unit integrity is crucial. Here we have the gentleman in the back of this patient. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I see the state of Florida has uh, slapped the ban on this, uh, or knocked the ban down at the Senate level on on confiscation of the weapons or the banning of the assault rifles. And there's other states that are trying to do this. If enough of them do this, what move do you think they'll take to counteract that? Okay. You can't have too many states doing this. Right. The states, first of all, what this is is designed to keep, we, we have to fight that. What we've been playing is little Dutch boy for a long time. We've been on the defensive. We plug this hole and this hole and then this hole. Whoops. Well, what's happened is while they were busy fighting the state operations, remember they're still they're still going at us at the federal level, and that's what we're seeing right now. These have all been ways to keep us busy with minor actions while a major campaign has been taking place, and the whole front is moving. And now they are very close to another victory within a very short period of time that will give them the authority to come into many homes. And that's what they're interested in doing right now. The omnibus Crime Package, S-8, along with 3355, which includes our discussion about the Hong Kong police being recruited into the FBI, DEA, and ATF inside the United States. <coughs> the reason that they're doing this... Huh? 100,000. Well, there'll be a large number. They'll be incorporated in the National Police Force when they're done. What they need them for is not so much that they're that great a mercenary, but they have experience with all of the electronic warfare technology they're going to use on us, like the smart card that they want. Hong Kong has already had this. All of their cars already have sensors in them, and every car can be tracked 24 hours a day in Hong Kong, period. What they're doing is taking and hiring the people 
who have good experience in how to use the technology and bringing them here to use it against us. And that's their primary mission. Also the chip. They've had experience with using the chip and they've been, they've been employing it in different ways in the past. These people know how to use it, how to track it, how to identify quirks in the system, and that's why they're being brought here so it can be incorporated the rest of the way. Once the S-8 bill is merged the rest of the way with 3355, which is all that's waiting to happen, the bills have passed. You've got to understand that. I can't stress that enough. When the NAFTA treaty and the Brady bill passed, the crime bill passed. It's just like everything else. Watch this hand, watch this hand. Whoops, we got you by the short hairs again. It is a, it's that they did not believe, and they were right, that we would accept two helpings of what we call shit pie at one time. No matter how much sugar coating you put on it, people would start to think. The thing that's happened here is this. i got to explain. So if you look at this as a timeline, your enemy wanted to stretch this out over a period of months or years even. What happened is, because of all your efforts, and this shows that you do count, we've pushed every one of these windows back. And now, instead of being spread out over a long distance, they're bunched up into a very short window. But because of that, it is now very obvious what the overall program is, and that's what scares the hell out of them. You can see it. Even the, the inanely stupid out there, who don't want to listen to a word you had to say, can see it. And they know what's happening. They just don't want to admit it yet. You know, panic hasn't set him back here. In your opinion, I know it may be difficult uh, for the non-patriot people who are the non-believers. How long do you think it'll be before this will be so evident that they'll see it? And how much time do you think it'll be before, we, before this whole thing starts to really start to mushroom? Openly. We're in the middle of a window right now. Well, we, before we came down here, in fact, you were one of the first groups that asked if we could come down. And we kind of and we, we based everything upon coming here, really. Everything mushroomed out from there. We can't tell you what some very nice experiences here in the last few days. I mean, by visiting hundreds and thousands of people. But we're in the middle of it. We were almost trying to decide whether or not we should be on the road right now when we left a week and a half ago. Because it's very bad to be halfway across the country away from our power base with what might be happening in our homes. But we had to balance that with the fact that we can't stop right up until the last minute to try and organize better and to bring the patriot movement in the same direction. To understand there's a problem I have, and you all heard different things, and I want, to, I want to get in touch on this to really help here. Thank you. I have heard this time and again, and I do not want to ever hear this, and you will not hear me dwell on this subject. We will not backbite each other. We must not have fighting amongst the patriot elements. That's right. Your enemy laughs at you when he sees that. He's laughing all the way to the bank when he sees that. He's chuckling in his pocket. <clears throat> we may have disagreements amongst ourselves. We must talk privately about that. Okay, now I guess there are some things that are not acceptable that have to be contained. But, overall, we must show a consolidated effort in which we have a common goal. And don't forget that. Okay, even if we may not fully enjoy what it is that somebody's saying over here, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And if that person's busy dealing with the same problem you're dealing with, that's that many more bullets going down range that you don't have to worry about. They're going the right way, not over here. Okay? So keep that in mind always. Yes? Um, question. Um, what is the degree of trust or control the UN has over its foreign forces? Because wouldn't that be actually embarrassing to them that they ship foreign troops over here and the first thing they do is walk over to us and say, hi, I'm going to join you. <laughs> yep, exactly. What they have to do is create a, a sense of futility. They've been trying to do this for a long time. If you look at it, it's like the Star Trek with the Borg. It is futile to resist. You shall be absorbed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, in reality, it's, it's futile to send some of the troops over here sometimes. The best example, the Hessians were, if you recall, the Hessians were German citizens, or in other words, German peasants, who were conscripted by their princes and sold to the British government as mercenaries. They didn't sell themselves. Their princes sold them. When they were in British service, they came over here and the British told them that all oh, the Americans are such heathens that they will capture you and skin you alive and eat your flesh while you're still breathing and then butcher you the rest of the way. Well, they got over here and they found out that, well, gee, we got legs and arms just like everybody else. We were, we were breathing, living people. 
And in fact, we were very happy to have new citizens. And so there were many Hessians who surrendered, came over to our side, and either fought the rest of the war, or at least were not an asset for the enemy. Because they knew where they came from, they would never be free at the time. So they came over to us. And the same problem they have right now. It's the same situation. They're scared of that, too. And one, more off here. Yeah. And one more question in line with this. In line with this, like, the, as you know, probably there'll be some Americans who will be co-towing to New Orleans, like or not. But how many of them are actually co-towing? How many of them are actually part of us? Part of us, but they're using what's the, what's the term? The intelligence gathering role, right? Like that. That's where so you we don't have to maybe shoot them ourselves. So exactly. Here. That's where there's a problem, and you'll have to we'll deal with that locally. There's a fine line there too. Yeah. There's a such there is such thing as a double agent also. Yeah. People who will make you believe they're working for either side yeah. when either side's winning. Mm -hmm. You know, the flag over here. Yeah. <laughs> It's like if you're in France, if you remember Alsace Lorraine, invaded by the Germans and French so many times, they just kept two flags. <laughs> <laughs> Here they come again. Here they come again. You get the wrong flag. That's right. Oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Then. Better be the right flag. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you do go to jail. Excuse that's right. Mark. Yes. How do we indoctrinate these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? Okay. Well, the Christian population. Now, there's how many hands we have at first? That's much. What? Right, okay. What? Uh, questions. Okay. Uh, the, the the problem you're probably running into is some people saying, "Oh, I'm not going to do anything because everything will be fine." And they say I should be a lily of the field and I shouldn't do anything. Well, you know what? If you leave the gate open, the wolves come and eat your lunch. And what I'll use, and I think I'll give you the best example, what I have found in my personal faith, this is what I believe, is the parable of the Good Shepherd. Uh, you all know the parable of the Good Shepherd, because if, you're all, if you've been to Sunday school, it's been taught to you a dozen times in, in your youth. I will we'll tell you, because this is how it works. The shepherd knew that a lamb was missing, and he realized that he was in the wilderness, up on the rocks. So risking everything in the whole flock, he left the flock, to go save the one lamb. And he crawled up on the rocks, and he took the little lamb and threw him over his shoulders, and he brought the little lamb down to the bottom of the hill. And when he was done, the wolves were waiting. He grabbed the lamb and threw it to him, didn't he? It's not how it works, is it? The Good Shepherd parable was meant to explain to you that you have an obligation and that you have a position that you are beholden to. And you must understand the history of being a Good Shepherd. The good shepherd at night would find a safe place with three walls, like a valley or a rock wall, that he could protect the lambs and put them in. And then he usually made a corral out of rock. And traditionally, if you look in the Bible, you remember that those areas were special to that family. That was that shepherd's place to hold his flock, and he kept them there. At night, he didn't walk home, punch the clock, and, well, whatever happens to the sheep happens to the sheep. He, be he became the physical fence. He became the gate at the entranceway. And he lay there through the night. They took turns, but he was there for a reason. Because eventually he knew that there would be a threat to the flock. Either thieves, which weren't as common, but there were still predators such as wolves and other animals. And so his job was to wait. Now, he didn't have to go anywhere for trouble, because as a good shepherd he had something precious to take care of. And the wolves would come anyway. Now, did he take one of his precious lambs that he just saved off the rocks and throw it as a sacrifice to the wolves to keep them busy? No. Did he compromise in any way with the wolves? If he did, he wasn't a good shepherd and his family would starve, and, the, and in fact probably the community would too because the shepherd had a mission to produce food for the people. And so instead he took his wolf stick, you know, his shepherd staff, and he went out and he did battle with the wolf, and he, if, if he could, he killed it to destroy a threat to the flock. He didn't go out looking for them because he didn't have to go looking for them. He could not compromise with them because you cannot compromise with evil. Ever. And so in the end, he had to resist. Now, when he killed the wolf, does that mean it was the end of the story? No, because there are a lot of wolves out there. And the next night, oh, they were out there again. So he had to be the good shepherd every night 
and he had to be diligent. And when he was done, just like we're talking about our nation today, he passed that shepherd's staff off to his son, and his son to his son, that shepherd's staff off to his son, and his son to his son, and they maintained their vigilance every night. So you're obligated to do the same thing. And Christians that claim that they do not will, I believe, have to face their Creator, and He's going to ask them what I know He's going to ask me. This is a gift from God. We are the Caesars of this land. We have no king, we have no queen. People seem to forget that. You are the sovereign of this nation. When the time comes, you're going to stand before God and He's going to ask you, did you do everything to preserve the gifts that I gave you? And you better be able to say yes. So those Christians who say that they're not beholden to protect this nation, which is unlike others, I challenge that they are not being good shepherds and that they are failing the flocks of this land. Because if the Christian population will stand, will not stand up and be the moral guide, and if they will not stand up and be the shining beacon, who will? If morality doesn't stand, the immoral are next in line. And that's why we have what we have now with this government and this nation as it stands today. Um, <coughs> I did discuss it, yes, in the second video. Yes. And there's anybody probably can get a copy of whatever's here tonight, too, so it's possible. Mark? You, um, yeah, go ahead. Right you had mentioned earlier to me about some church that was under siege up your way. Uh, what was the story behind that church that the federal government surrounded? And what oh, it? okay. What we had was in Indianapolis, we had uh, one of the largest churches in the area, uh, Pastor Dixon is his name. He found out and realized the full folly of having a registered church. Because by income tax laws, for instance, taxation laws, you are, the, the government does not have the power to tax a church. Never has, never will. But what they've done is convinced everybody to think they need to be non-profit. You're already non-profit. You're a church. You can't have taxes levied against you. However... Once you become non-profit and sign the contracts with the government, and that's what this is, licentiousness, once you receive a license, what happens is you have given the state and the government authority then to come into your church. Well, what they decided to do with this church, as many others have done across the country, is to disenfranchise themselves from this contract. When they did so, the federal government demanded the records of the church. They wanted the names of all the members, they wanted all the financial records. They wanted all the data and information from that, that mechanism. Why? Because just as if you've ever been with the JCs or the Rotary or anything else, if your nonprofit organization goes belly up, all the records are to go to the government. And they're held for seven years there before they're then put into a separate trust again and locked away until such time as that organization is resurrected. Well, they were going to try and punish the church, and they were going to have the list of all the evil offenders. The pastor stood before the gates of the church when they came, and they brought the warrant to the church in front of him, and they said, we are going to serve it to him, like this. He took it up, folded it, and stuck it back in the pocket of the federal agent that was there. They immediately grabbed his arm, pulled it around behind him, threw him to the ground, and forcibly handcuffed him with no resistance. They still abused him. They dragged him away. They charged him with assaulting a federal officer. For six to seven days, members of the church, and this has a, a 10,000 member congregation overall, at any given time at least 5,000 people attend this church. It's an independent church, not affiliated. They were under siege for seven days with people inside armed trying to protect the church from attack. This was about the time that Waco had taken place, and they probably could not afford a second situation like this. Helicopters came every day over the church at point-blank range and scanned it with infrared, and it's obvious it had the pop bellies underneath the whole nine yards. They charged the pastor with assault and then convicted him within less than seven to nine days. He was sentenced to 17 years in prison with no criminal history and no criminal background or record. However, 
the lawyer, who was one of his members of the church, looked at the papers and realized, wait a minute, he was charged under Article 3, but he was sentenced under something under Article 47, U.S. Code. He couldn't figure out what it was. So he went back through the USC and found out they had charged him under one thing and sentenced him under the martial law guidelines. Ah. Well, they threw it out. They actually got him cleared because they tried this foolishness as quickly as they could, figuring they could push it through the court. They won. He is out. He has been out for quite some time now. But this situation developed very, very quickly. They just realized again that this was not going to be allowed to happen. And many other people did find out regionally, but not nationally. Not everybody knows how this took place. The pastor has supported and in fact had a, a independent church conference, a couple of them in the last few months, in which 200 different churches have come and visited and have received seminars on what took place and how they can free their church. Or the fact they're already free, but they want to make sure they can maintain their independence. Because the New World Order wants to control all churches, period. There will be no free independent churches anywhere. <coughs> that is the bottom line. So what can you do to fight that directly politically? Can you sue? Can there be a lawsuit? <coughs> the lo well, unfortunately, there's a problem with this. Most people, it, it would be nice if we could sue them, but what has happened in the past is that several federal laws were established which make it impossible or exonerate federal agents from being charged or sued to say that the common citizen would be for violating the law. And so there are, there's a variety of convoluted situations you have to go through to try and get at them. And even then, it's almost impossible today. So the best they can say is that he is free, that the church has not been disturbed since, and is operating fully. And it is now free and independent. It is no longer registered with the state or with the feds. So it is good with respect to that. They've won their, they won what they wanted, but they had to pay a price. It's not enough, though. I, I agree. But the point is, they're trying to make a state out. That battle is being fought at their level, and are they, if they're successful, or if they lose, they will let us know. We'll have more information on that. The problem is, if, at the very least, right now, we're, we're, we're in a series of holding actions. Our mission is, right at this time, to calculate, do we fight or do, in fact, we may have to anyway, I won't say it that way, but when we fight, we'll have to be in earnest. And when we do fight, I, ha I can't stop until we win. But for the but for the time that we have, as long as we as patriots can hold them back as as linemen, we're busy pushing the line back and wherever we can. We're giving everybody behind us time to fix bayonets, cock, lock, and load, and get ready for the war. The more time we can give our people, the better prepared they are. The more weapons we have, the better the trained people we have. We're trying to buy some time. We've given you a lot of time as it is. We've been in this for a long time doing what we're doing now. This has been awfully expensive for us. We, every waking hour we have, and sometimes we don't go to sleep, and a lot of the patriots have been doing the same thing. We're not the only ones. We have fought it legislatively. We have fought it administratively, and we're right up to that point where we've almost run out of options. <coughs> we're almost up to the wall. At this point, it's just a matter of, again, deciding when they, when they decide to go fanatic, we must defend ourselves. Yes. Um, Mark, uh, when you talk about never again with the, the Waco type incident, you say this church, for instance, uh, a lot of people asked us when we're disseminating this information to them, uh, how are we going to handle the next one? Are we going to allow the militia in the area to take care of it, or are we going to load up and travel there and handle it? Elements should be prepared that are the best available to perhaps assist whatever takes place locally. That does not mean that you strip your resources here because I personally believe that when the next one happens, which will be quite abusive, it will make Waco, and we all know how terrible that was, it will make Waco seem pleasurable because the first assault will be much more disciplined, much more aggressive, and will be far more brutal and destructive in their initial action. They must terrify the people. To do that, they will use whatever force is available and necessary to create that destruction. Will that not uh, kind of overrun the local militia unless they're really well organized? Well, as much as anything else, remember this. We're fighting in a different plane. And one of the problems that I've seen, in fact, in Waco, in watching the videotapes, everything that we've seen, all the different information, 
The only thing I, I'm sorry to say is this, that we had the capability to deal with the external forces even though they were in depth. In other words, they had an external crust security that was 20 miles out that was kind of roving to see what was on the road. They had internal helicopter security and support surrounding the area. That was irrelevant. Then they had their ground elements, which to me were, first of all, some were professional. The inner core of the murderers were. But all the auxiliaries that they brought in were from all over the country and were no better equipped nor any better prepared than your best regular militia regiments. And what would have to happen is patience. There was a 51-day siege there. Personally, by day 22 to 25, that situation should have been in our hands. And in looking at it overall, we could have dealt with the threat. The armor was irrelevant. I've seen the internal photographs and the internal uh, videos that were done by the FBI and the ATF. Uh, with that photo intelligence, I can lay down a complete overview and explain to you what they were doing from the outside. Knowing that, we could have effectively disemboweled them, the armor would have been ours, the helicopters would have been useless, and we could have laid siege to them in reverse. Actually, I wouldn't have done it. I would have actually eaten them alive. And it would have been necessary. It would have been an option. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt you. I need to make just a quick announcement. Go right ahead, please. I'm playing a little devil's advocate. Do you think maybe the way to over the test to see if you could draw something out, to see if you could draw a militia out? Well, they wanted to test to see, first of all, if we were willing to react and how far they could go. The initial attack was supposed to be more successful, in my view of what happened. It would seem like they didn't keep going in. In other words, they stay outside shooting. They really didn't, you know, take well, the whole crowd normally charges in and something like that. That's why I'm it's kind of acted a little funny, like maybe that's their living for kind of not really charge in and uh, just cause this standoff to see if they could draw out, uh, you know, a bigger, into a bigger, you know, the set march along. You mean with the initial attack? Yeah. Well, the initial attack is typical of what, we were, of what would be expected, but what they expected was a different response. What that was was a classic hammer and anvil operation. The forces that hit initially were supposed to drive either, either blunt shock anybody who was initially made contact with and was to panic the rest of the group to fall back out of the building or to surrender in panic. Well, that's what I'm wondering. It seemed like two cattle truck loads of these guys arrived, and only, you know, we see a couple on the roof, and a couple ran in, a couple ran in. In other words, it seemed to me if it was going to be a frontal attack, they all went on and knocked the door down like you see in these, you know, TV cocktails. A lot of them? And everybody <coughs> ran right in the door, and the whole mob. But the majority of stayed out front. Well, the yeah, majority of the initial... The outside just keep shooting in the windows. So. Well, because there's only... Okay, you understand what happened here. First of all, explain the overall action. In a hammer and anvil operation, the objective is to create terror and drive the occupant. Okay. The helicopter elements were not just diversion. Their objective, in fact, really the front was a diversion. The helicopter support was supposed to come in and after initially engaging the way it did, would drop its support to the rear of whatever action force was pushing. As the dazed occupants flee or fall back or scream and holler running from the house, the anvil picks up the resistance, picks up the leftovers. And between the two, they're herded into a, like we said, a hammer and anvil mechanism, squashed between the middle. Now, there was only a limited amount of, uh, there were only a limited number of points where they could make contact and break through. And obviously, they tried to execute the initiative with, with some surprise, which they knew they'd lost. So I think there was, there was some apprehension on the part of the attack forces. I will tell you this, these are paid mercenaries, they're not professionals. And because of that, as I think came out in the trial, and most people here we can discuss it, what scared them the most is when they forced them to write their blood type on their neck. That's something that they'd never done in the past, and what that told me is they expected casualties on both sides. The ideal situation was to create panic. They picked a target that traditionally had been soft, that had cooperated in the past. What better target to abuse? But somebody who in the past has been told, Oh, when they show up, we're going to show them what we got. We'll be fair. We'll be equal. We'll be nice. Well, they didn't care about that. And in reality, what they were hoping to do is that when these people came forward, when they came out, you'd have some bloody casualties and maybe some dead. You'd have the children sobbing, which is what they had to have for the propaganda. Remember, everybody was being abused. Everybody was being abused. What I'm wondering is, you know, maybe it was set that way to get this stand up going to see if you draw the militia out. Well, the... The next problem with that is, see, they did not, I, I, you got to understand the perspective of the aggressor. He didn't, he did not understand, nor even now, I'm really serious about this, because I've seen this, I've worked from the other end, 
they did not perceive at that time fully our capabilities with regard to the militia. <coughs> they knew that some existed, and they never considered them a serious threat. They perceived they perceived this objective had it had a propaganda mission, just like the Weavers was that was a hunter killer operation gone awry. This act. Ex, excuse me. This action was supposed to be a demonstration of their fierce totalitarian capability. It was a multi-agency effort. The FBI and the ATF were the first attack. The FBI helped to coordinate at least, and definitely was involved in giving the air support um, in, in roundabout ways by providing the command and control mechanism. We still don't really know who was in the command and control helicopter, which is, is, is spiked my curiosity. Because traditionally, the politicals like to show up to watch their butchery. And that one helicopter is the one that's not accounted for because it disappears later and falls back. The other two, needless to say, were damaged heavily enough that they force landed two and four miles out. That means that even if, if whoever shot them, and we are, you know, we, can, we, we might get better information than that, which is what I was hoping tonight to find out. No incrimination involved here, but either way, the helicopters were damaged by some form of small arms fire. They fell back, which means the aggressor lost one-third of his combat element with the stroke of a pen. Out. Once those choppers were lost, the troops were lost with them, all smaller combat force on the ground. They are not in control of elements that they were supposed to be in control of, and the defender progressively realized that the aggressor was serious. So as this escalated, these mercenaries, who are normally used to kicking a door in and finding me and my wife half-naked, with our kids screaming in the other room. Instead, they were fully clothed, standing on their feet, and they were in their own home. So they were able to do what they were supposed to do. And if the only problem I have is, again, there are other actions that should have taken place instead of allowing their wounded to fall back and allowing them to escape. I believe, personally, there are a couple things here I can throw in. They had run out of ammunition or expended most of their munitions, wasting it on the people that were inside of the building. They were stunned because they did not expect an attack. And in the videotape, what told me the most about that, if you watch the one piece, one ATF agent standing there just like this. I've seen it before, bat like, like battle shock. He's looking, and somebody says something over here, and the guy in front of him, there's no organization, there's no coordination. The guy's standing there with a gun to his side, and he goes like this. Like he doesn't know where the hell he's going or where the hell he's been. And the guy that's in front of him is holding the shield like this, like here's a threat. And he goes like like this with the other guy. And then he kind of, he doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know what to do. So I say, you see, most of them hide behind the truck. <laughs> right, well, <laughs> cover and concealment. Try to protect thy own ass first, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and the Tet Offensive marksmanship is typical, too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I think I hit him. That's right, I think I hit him. Well, maybe I didn't, but let's do it some more. The problem with that is, it's like Hollywood, you can only do that so many times, and eventually there's no more... Yeah. To do. Which again gets back to accuracy. Boom. Yes. Yeah. And it's done. Yes. And I'm kind of line with the question that was earlier. If we, if we ever do have to deploy, deploy you know, in some type of way to a situation, you know, the only way I see it is that we end up being used as like a wall and we almost get to say to them, you know, if you, if you want to church or whatever, you have to go through what? The problem, the problem is that there are going to be two elements involved. There's an overt element and a covert arm. And I really wouldn't want to, we'll discuss privately what, what the objectives are and how it has to be done. But the technique is very, is, is not only complicated, but what needs to happen is that you have to have your best fighters positioned properly. And again, patience is the key. Haste makes waste and usually gets people killed. <coughs> okay. That comes from the trust of me when you do something like that. It's like you basically, if you don't stand there, you see who blinks first. They that's right. They that way for propaganda, too. Yeah, but then the problem is that propaganda is also backfires a lot more people who do militia fire. Well, thank, that's another thing. The next time, the media won't be there. Yeah. One thing I'll remind you of at the very end of the, of the siege, if you're watching the videotapes of the uh, burning of the buildings, if you look, you can identify three separate ATF or FBI camera crews filming the burning. You watch, in one scene alone, you'll see one guy with a camera unit like this filming all of the burning rubble as it's burning in the first stages, and another guy is about 15 feet to his left with another camera doing the exact same thing, panning all the wreckage while they're shoveling it into the building, videotaping everything. I said this before, this is the best proof 
of who fired first and what happened. If the government were in the right, the government confiscated every piece of video footage from the attack. They could demonstrate their quote-unquote innocence by simply showing the cameras that were running from the moment they jumped out of the cattle cars, not just the little bits and pieces. That's why they had to edit it. But what showed me the obvious fact that they were lying <clears throat> is when they got to the explanation of what happened at the very end, after everything was done. If you'll remember, not a single piece of photo photography or videotape footage was used at all. That tells me that if they, they knew that if they'd opened up that Pandora's box, that the first thing that I'd do if I was standing there say, I'd like to see the rest. When do we get to see all of it? You see, they wanted everybody to ignore the image. information that was needed by the people to put these people in jail instead of the people that they tried to put in jail after the siege. And so that must be remembered by everybody. Where I do say this, I'll say this again. I don't mean to do this to the guys who run the cameras here. Rule number one, shoot the cameraman. Okay, don't let him get away. I'm serious. You see him in a tree, you see him on the ground, shoot the cameraman, get the camera. It's got the evidence. And then run with it. Take a courier, throw him in whatever direction is safe, and have him run with that technology and get out of the area. Escape with it. Reproduce it. These things are terrible. You can copy, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be done in the future. That's if we think we'll be able to fight legally. I don't think it'll it'll be possible after this because they cannot afford another situation like that to develop. So they won't let it happen again. Not the way they did. I have another question that's important from your aspect of being militaristic minded. You know. Um, if everyone, if David Crush would have been allowed to write a 7 CM manuscript as agreed upon, everyone would have come out. What do you think would have happened to the evidence, to Mount Carmel, to certain people, well, to the survivors that would have left the building? If, if that scenario would have, were to have happened, if they could have, if they would have allowed that, it would have been a bad situation for the Fed, and that's why they couldn't. I said that during before the siege, before the siege really developed. Once that incident had taken place. They could not afford to let the people, they had to continue to compound the situation. They could not afford to let them leave unless they could force a situation that would destroy the physical evidence that would damn the government on this. They had to have the fire. Yeah. And the fact that when you see in the footage the tanks with the, the tanks are pushing the wreckage in, that's all I needed to see. Law enforcement officers are told to preserve the scene of the crime. If that's the case, and ATF agents supposedly were running the dozers and you know, the combat engineer vehicles and the flame projector units and whatever, the chemical warfare units, then their job, knowing what they did, was to make sure that that building did not burn to the ground. If there was debris that was compromised but outside of the area of destruction, it was to be left there. I'll give you the best example. Anybody ever seen a plane crash? Yeah. After a plane crash, we'll take chunks of metal the size of my thumb and piece them back together to find out what happened to that plane. And with modern ballistics and with modern thermal technology, we can identify exactly what happened to that plane. And that thing is a hell of a lot worse than a building burn. Because you're talking itty bitty bits of pieces of people, parts and components, and the ground mixed together. And they'll take a hanger and they'll commit months, if not even years, to develop a scenario to understand what happened to that wreckage. So here we have a situation where many people died, and yet conveniently the government just made a bunch of little oopsies. That doesn't happen. And I said this the other day, and I'll say it again. If you have an employee that makes these kinds of mistakes time and time and time again, it's about time you fired him. That's right. That's Excellent. Okay, we're just looking at your Florida, your, uh, Florida State Militia cards. This is very well done. This is excellent. This is the kind of work that needs to be done. Now, this is actually organized militia. Got you, you little monster. You want some uh, bug spray? No, I'm okay. They just now, I think it's the light. I'm naturally, I'm naturally deadly to bugs, I guess. They don't even seem to bother me down here this year.
Um, most of you are probably already participating with the militia, but if you're not, I recommend that if you're in outside an area where you're not close enough to be part of one of the regiments that are already organized, what we tell everybody to do is get your act together and organize yet another one. We need as many organized regiments completed as quickly as possible. That can't be emphasized enough. And the reason is their safety in numbers. It's also a shell game. So if you have different elements, you can shift forces and capabilities. You can perform counterintelligence activities, creating shadow elements in some area, functional elements in another. It's very important that you adopt many practices that are traditional that do work that are impossible to counter in many cases, especially when we compartmentalize the mechanism the way it is. I'll give him a minute, because it looks like... Are you changing tapes? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, I'll wait. Not about Mark, why don't you break it? I'll tell you what we can do. Would you like to break and eat? Because I know you're probably hungry. Yeah, yeah. 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 We'll see if everyone's here. We're eating anyway. Uh, three portions. Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't know that. I thought I heard him back there. Yeah. 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 Take them home. Oh, we'll probably take two each. <laughs> 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 He must have caught one today. Yeah. This is one during the day that was caught an ass and shot about 100 feet over the house. Approximately 100 feet. Wednesday, 545. We went past that picture. Three around. days ago. What city? Trayvon oh, yeah. Park. Downtown. <coughs> Downtown where? Blackhawk. Right Downtown where? Avon Park. Avon Park, Florida. Okay. <laughs> you shoot it down. <laughs> shoot it with a gun. That was the third one this oh. week. He lost his roof if you shot it down. Come down on his house. Or the neighbors, which is okay. Yeah. If you want to know his neighbors are patriots. Oh, okay. We can't do that. Yeah. Okay. Converted most of my neighborhood. <laughs> Either run them off or convert them. <laughs> Mark. Yes. You were briefly touching on the uh, militia card before. Did you want to expound upon that or? Oh no, I just uh, comp was company. Uh, the format is good. Uh, if you're going to be doing that, then that's of course the stats above the militia large, but below the organized militia. The way that's set, that's that's excellent. Because you're not with a guard, you're with the you're with the regular militia, states militia forces, not under the authority of the federal government, which is important. It's uh, just to touch on that. Everybody should understand. We we discussed this beforehand. The fact that the state has a national defense force separate from the national guard. Just to make sure that everybody understands how the tiers of our military are supposed to work. And the first level, the active military forces of the union, are. Uh, of course, the regular Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, etc. The next tier are Army. Over there. Okay. Okay. Is that good? It's cameraman still. Cameraman's going to want to change the position of the camera, though. Anyway, uh, the next tier below that is the Army Reserve. And many people are not familiar with the Army Reserve with respect to the fact that it is a federal force, not the National Guard. When you heard about the search and seizures that took place in Baltimore, the MJTF forces that were there were not National Guard forces, they were Army Reserve, which means those were federal forces working as law enforcement inside the United States. That is against the law in direct violation of Posse Comitatus. That specifically restricts the U.S. military from being used against the American population in any way, shape, or form unless a national emergency is declared and signed by the President. That won't be a problem. That won't be a problem, that's right. Well, actually, nobody's had the guts to do that for quite some time, for obvious reasons. Hillary, yeah. Uh, yeah. She's the one who has the male out of town. Yeah. Anyway. Right now, she's a lesbian, Mark. Well, at least I wish. He's a light man. That's a good name for it. The, uh, the, reserve, the reserve is the next tier. Beyond that is the National Guard, which is an organized militia, which traditionally used to be under the power of the state. The mistake is this. When the federal government provided arms for the, for the National Guard, a prostitution took place. And because they control the arms, they control the militia. So it is no longer a state's militia. The governor has some authority, but it is centralized with the federal government. 
Below that are the, the state's militias, or home guard, and then lower still, but no lesser, all of these are equal as far as military potential, is the militia at large. Now, the organized militias and state militias, there are 17 states that specifically have state guard or state home guard or state militia forces. Of those, most of them are heavily restricted by the state already also. So we have a situation where even they've been compromised. The militia at large and, regula and unregulated militia forces that are truly assigned to the people are all that is left to us that is not owned by the federal government, by the central forces. The problem with this is, of course, that they have some of the heavy weapons, or most of the heavy weapons that we can, that we can describe. That's not that complicated. We'll have those when we need them. But um, the amount of money spent, the resources available, unfortunately, that were spent over the last many decades are now going out. Those resources are going out to external forces. They will not be in our hands. We've gotten reports from all over the United States. In fact, we were in Mississippi. We just got several other hand-carried reports stating that the guards' weapons have been uh, disassembled, which is typical, of course, for security, that the ammunition has been transferred over to law enforcement for their training, and that the units themselves are being dispersed or being dissolved. And that's happening all over the United States. If we were going into a time of peace, one thing you should all remember is your National Guard gets more bang for the buck with regard to cost. You can buy just about four Guard units for the price of one regular Army unit. And traditionally, when we've come out of a war or even a major conflict of any kind, we reduce the number of active components and increase the number of guard. This is not happening right now. In fact, they're cutting back on guard elements dramatically in many areas. They're cutting back somewhat on active forces, and they are redistributing the wealth to ensure that the guard does not have the same potential in many cases that the federal forces have that are now under U.N. authority. Those few forces that are left intact are going to be transferred over, and as has been mentioned, they're talking about mobilizing these guard units to be used overseas. In the past, they have not wanted to do that because they were under our authority, but now that they're raising the UN flag over what they're doing is usurping state authority and slapping everybody in the face in the process when they do it by pulling the guard out and handing them right over to the United Nations. This is a final insult before tragedy strikes with regard to understanding what's happening inside the United States. This also takes many of the people, your brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles or relatives, out of the country so that they will not interfere with activities that may take place in the future if they have their way. Remember, the guard, the one good thing is, they eat, breathe, and sleep with you. They're part of the community. They're there every day. It is hard to get them or convince them to turn around and mow down American citizens. They finally figured out they do not have the propaganda techniques or machine to turn the people away. And so what has happened is we are seeing a situation now where they've decided they're going to have to disperse the guard more effectively and get them off into the boondocks, out to Egypt, off to wherever, to make sure that they will not interfere when new resources are brought in. The militia at large can organize at whatever size it wishes. But it must be loosely organized, and in fact, the best, best of, the best of conditions anyway, as we've discussed, is dispersal. No large component is easily destroyed. No single component can be destroyed without all of the other elements knowing that an attack might take place. That is exactly, uh oh, that is exactly what happened at Lexington and Concord. Whoops. Oh, here. Sorry about that, Mark. That's okay. This one's tasty, too. <laughs> it's just, light, just light meat. Anyway, um... What down you got, please, Mark? Well, that's okay. I probably do, too. Oh, wait a minute. No, the, um... The important thing to understand here with the, uh, with the elements that we're discussing is that the militia at large experienced this before at Lexington and Concord. It was a, a militia at large unit in Lexington that originally faced the red coat tide stood on the green and actually took the brunt of most fire at the time. When this took place, needless to say, they didn't win, but it was the shock heard around the world. They faced the most sophisticated military force on the planet at the time, fresh from victories in Europe. They were here to enforce firearms confiscation, excessive taxes. We've heard this all before, haven't we? Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. Confiscation of property. 
One of the first things that they did at Lexington is the same thing they did at Concord. The British commanders allowed the troops to go in, take luggage, which was a booty prize at the time, just like we're seeing today with the way they're making it profitable to come into your home. They let them take the luggage, take the silver, take the VCR. Oops, it's a little early for that. But take whatever they wanted, and then they burn the home. Well, they did this to 14 to 16 structures there before they had to shuffle them on down the road. They were having so much fun, but they had other missions. They had other business to attend to. So they proceeded on to Concord, which was one of their primary targets. They were there to confiscate cannon, shot, powder, ball, and the owners. They collected it. Yeah, they collected it. They got the little parts. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happened is, of One course, of lost their lives. Yeah, the, the town was virtually deserted, if you'll recall, when they came in. There were no occupants to identify. People had already left their homes and fled. And in the process, the British came in, and the British commander had one of his, one of his uh, troops bring out a large chair, a, like a lounge chair. He sat down in the village square on the cobblestones and then told his men to do their duty. And they went a house at a time and cleaned it out of the valuables and then set it afire. They went house to house to house in the downtown area like this where they started ravaging and pillaging the place. This was nothing new and was very traditional as punishment, by the way. Well, in the process, when they were finished, or as they, as they initiated this, Meanwhile, U.S. militia forces were gathering from all of the surrounding areas, and it is said as many as 10,000 responded total. Not all of them originally engaged in the action, but they did help to bottle up the British in Boston when they were finished. In the initial stages, as we know, they, came, they gathered on several of the overlying hills, and they could see the smoke of Concord. This, of course, burned in their hearts even greater the desire to engage this enemy who had come to pillage their homes. And so first engagement at the bridge and then several other locations in town, the British decided to retreat, not being able to confiscate what they desired and not being able to arrest anybody. So in the process, they were walked one foot at a time all the way back with blood on the ground, corpses on the cobblestone all the way back to Boston. The Patriots then, of course, bottled them up for a period of time. And in several attempts to try and break the blockade, for instance, we have what is known as the Battle of Bunker Hill, which in reality was Breed's Hill. Breed's Hill is where all the major fighting started. Bunker Hill was behind Breed's Hill, which were a series of bluffs overlooking the harbor. If these had been established as artillery positions, they could virtually command the ocean. And this was the fear of the British commanders. So they landed forces again, and yet another major attempt with amphibious forces, with present state-of-the-art technology, heavy weapons, etc. They engaged the hill, and they lost a six-to-one exchange ratio. For every one Patriot who fell, six of theirs fell. And even though they had no bayonets, and that's where they suffered the greatest number of casualties, by the way, that's why it's so symbolic they take the bayonet lug off your rifle, because at Breed's Hill, the defenses were set up so that the forces were unfortunately pinned in, and when it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting, the British soldier was very adept with his bayonet, while the American soldier had his rifle to be used as a club or his personal tomahawk, if he was lucky. This, of course, created a disadvantage, because if you've ever seen a traditional brown vest or a martial arm of the day, I've got a seven-foot spear, you've got a club. Who do you think wins? Well, they fell back from the position and restruck their ground near Bunker Hill, but the British, realizing the amount of casualties that they had received with the simple weapons in the hands of the American patriot, decided that they could not hold, yes, that they could not hold that ground successfully. That's why this SKS should have a bayonet, why all of your rifles should, if at all possible. The reason is very straightforward. Under the Geneva and Hague treaties, it states uncategorically that uh, in order for you to be a military force, you must have, number one, a uniform, two, preferably, <coughs> An insignia, like the in identifying insignias that we know are here today, and it can be a symbol of any kind that's appropriate, and that you must have a martial arm if at all possible. And a martial arm includes what? A bayonet. Why is it that the Gun Control Act of 1968 specifically stip stipulates that bayonets were a big no-no, that this was evil? Anybody here have any bayonet charges between drug lords lately? Uh, not very many, 
But on the other hand, if you're going to try and dictate that anybody who resists the New World Order is a pirate or a brigand or a thief or a terrorist, needless to say, you can't let them have martial arms because under the Hague and Geneva Treaty, you are a combatant, not simply a brigand or a, or a traitor or a treason thief or whatever. You're a soldier. And despite what title they try to place, the important thing is that you maintain that position. So the bayonet is important. I prefer the spear of the bayonet. I prefer saving ammunition when it comes to the ATF, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's one of the things I do enjoy. The spear of the bayonet is to, of course, kill. And in this case, this will do a fine job. Penetrate body armor. That's right. Penetrate body armor works just like a can opener. Thrust, twist, fire. Of course, with that close, you didn't want to shoot him necessarily anyway. But, you know. <laughs> What, what, what act was that again? Huh? What act was that? The Hague and Geneva Conventions. The Hague. The Hague. Hague. Hague and Geneva Conventions of War. And there are several updates to that every so many years when they have na international meetings. However, it's the Gun Control Act of 1968 where they attempted to take and, and make it illegal, of course, to possess a rifle or import rifles with the bayonet lug. Which, of course, with the bayonet lug, made them militia or military arms. They're cutting off the SKS bayonet lugs now. Yep. Now, the interesting thing about that is when you look at it from a different perspective and understand that 7277, the document drawn up to abolish the U.S. military of the United States and transfer it over to the United Nations, dictates that the American people must be disarmed too. It makes sense that one of the last things that they would do is to cooperate by altering our laws through the color of law to conform with United Nations regulations and requirements to disarm the slaves. That's us. And so instead, we've got enough of these, I think, that originally when they let these in, by the way, their logic was to give us enough to get us killed, but not enough to win. Keep that in mind. Improvise. That's right. The last, that's right. Improvise. That's right. Improvise, modify, and change. American people have a tendency to do that. We find something, we'll make it, we'll, we'll alter it to our desired needs, we'll make it better in our eyes. Yes? What country do we have a fight that abided by the Geneva Convention? <laughs> Nobody ever has. The whole point being, that's the whole problem, is that in this case, as uh, somebody said in a very famous movie everybody probably knows, the Geneva Convention? I ain't never heard of it. I think that's pretty straightforward. So with regard to this, though, these rifles are much more than just a surplus item. They're compatible with our desired needs, effective, inexpensive, easy to maintain, robust. You can hand them down to your kids. Your kids can use them later. They'll get something better find something you like, you can hand this on to another patriot, and he can find a better weapon. But this is a good start. And if all else fails, down the road I'm sure it'll have some intrinsic value when you carve the date in it, you know, campaign in 96, winter campaign 97, you know, and put your initials in there, hand it on to the kids and they'll know who it came from. But with that in mind, that overall these weapons are desirable, they're effective, and they're needed. Rule number one. There are some very fine arms here tonight. I've seen them. In fact, I drool over them. But this rifle here I've carried in the past, and I have no problems with carrying today. It is a very effective arm. It will do the job, and it will do it most most desirably in that, uh, well, 22 million Chinese soldiers can't be wrong in one way. It works. Okay? <laughs> There's another 3 or 4 million the Russians made. I can tell you a little history behind that stuff that most people don't know. Well, wait. The, uh, the original one was made in 1908 in the United States of America by Remington. And our government sent our men to World War I with a damn bolt action, five shot Springfield against grease guns in Germany. And they had that in America, and we didn't use it. it and Remington quit making it in 1950, and the Russians bought up the patent rights from Browning started making it in 1953. Just a matter of time before it goes full circle, and mostly, the, usually the capitalists have provided everything for the other side, capable of killing most of us on the battlefield. We've upgraded our enemy. 
The other thing that should be considered about these arms is this. If you have five people to arm, better that you all be armed and then one be armed very well and everybody else be sharing a rifle. <laughs> Any ever better thought about that? You know, <laughs> sure, sure, go ahead. Doesn't work that way, does it? So with regard to these arms, the SKS standard model can be purchased for as little as probably around $89 to $100 or as much as $150, depending on which model we condition. That means that in place of one AR-15, you could buy two, three, or four of these, as much ammunition as is affordable, and what you have are four people armed, and in an ambush or in a defense, that's very desirable. What I also consider these rifles to be are garrison weapons, what we were talking about earlier with regard to defense. Whenever possible, you should have five or six spare arms that are in reserve, that are maintained with ammunition and just enough equipment so that if need be, when this man shows up buck naked because they burned his house out, I can go rifle, bandolier, go. And that's what's necessary. Now, the ideal thing about this is exactly how the Chinese look at this rifle. The difference is the man behind it. The American rifleman, number one, is more adept. We've had more training. We've got more skill. We're capable of engaging a target farther out. We're raised, in most cases, from birth. We have some familiarization with weapons. It makes all the difference in the world. We are a population of warriors, despite what anybody would like to say. And with regard to that, we do well. Other weapons, the AK-47 or the AK series rifles, are desirable. Some of them are a little, uh, shall we say, less robust than the original ones coming in. But I would recommend that if you have the Kalashnikov, that you buy automatically a drum, 75 or 100 round, whichever is available. And that makes a very desirable door stopper, or a very desirable air defense gun. There we go. Okay. Difference between the two arms. Just a moment. Automatic Kalashnikov, AK-47, AKM, a la you name it, AK something or other. In this case, the... Post post market version, standard beaver tail stock, 75 round drum, light package, easily maintained. The reason I recommend that all of you carry a drum is this. At night, for instance, and it's in the evening hours now, when traveling, although it makes a little noise, you have a lot of firepower here. Every man in the squad carrying one of these either as a security uh, a security individual or, for instance, in patrolling in safe areas, has one of these locked in the weapon and stick magazines for the rest of his transport. If you are ambushed, you flick the thing over to shoot, you know, kill, you start pulling the trigger and you don't have to worry about reloading for a little while. Now, rule number one about ambushes, I'm going to explain a few points here real quick. Ambushes. Three things people do in an ambush. Run. I mean, chances are they die. Stand there, which chances are they may still die, but at least they hopefully are shooting back. Three, identify and engage the target and fire the thing up and attack, attack. Identify and engage the target and fire the thing up and attack, attack, attack. Do not stay in the kill zone. If your entire element is carrying drums, you have a tremendous amount of firepower at your disposal initially. When the weapon, when this magazine empties, drop it and drop it. Pop it and drop it down. If you win, you can come back and get it. If you lose, you won't care. See? But this amount of firepower is also good for something else. Air defense. And with regard to that, you want to dump as many bullets into the target as you can as quickly as you can when you have an opportunity to shoot. This affords that. Another thing is that down the road, we may have to improvise air guns, aircraft firepower. These drums are priceless for that. They don't give you a lot, but they give you better than a single stick. And when you put these things in the proper aircraft, that's a little bit of ground attack you didn't have before. Also make nice door guns. Okay? So again, mother of invention. The Israelis did something very interesting. They didn't have enough heavy machine guns. So on the T-55s they were capturing, they would take four AKs in full auto, Put them in a pipe, rock, a pipe rack with a big bar like you used to put on the Fokers and on the old biplanes. And when they would target something, they'd pull back on the bar. You have a 150 or 100 round drum, boop, 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 and you pepper the area. So these are very, very desirable, and this is the way to go. Again, cost of the weapon varies, but it is still at this time more affordable than many of the other semi-autos that are on the market if you want something that takes a magazine. 
ammunition is still being made by any one of the American manufacturers if you can't get foreign import. At this time, you're still going to have to train. Train with your American reloadable ammunition, collect the brass, and reload it. Do not use your military brass for that purpose. The reason I say this, your factory military brass is designed to take battlefield conditions. Your reloadable brass is desirable for range condition. You can load it up identically. You can also reload indefinitely, provided you're good at it. Learn to reload. Okay? That's right, buy reloading supplies. The weapon is comfortable, easy to use, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, and in both cases these weapons are fully self-contained. Cleaning rod, cleaning kit are on board, the system itself is a, is a, uh, uh, shall we say, a, a, a user-friendly system, a very large gas system that's self-cleaning. Even if things drop in mud or water, it will continue to function. The gas system itself, of course, works the bolt carrier mechanism that we see here. And this system is self-cleaning. It's called works in a drawer. As it moves, it cleans out the tray, which is the receiver. So it's a very reliable weapon. In many cases, myself, I carried this longer than I carried an M16. In fact, I didn't carry an M16 until 1980. Before that, I was trained originally on an M14, and I mostly carried the AK or an SKS rifle with special warfare units. So this is a very desirable arm. It is a very reliable arm. The only mistake and the only problem is the Russians have it. That's the sad part. We can make this arm better. We can do a better job with it, bring up its accuracy, and make this weapon work for us if we wanted to. We may have to down the road. We'll probably adopt it in place of the arm that we have there many years to come. Yep. The actual design of that weapon is an M1 carbine. Yep. You take the bolt apart, the M1 carbine, and they're almost identical. Hey, Mark. No, that's, that's, that's not necessarily that a disadvantage because that means they carry the same ammo. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's the advantage of that. Okay, now, just very quickly. Good. The standard SKS only has a 10 round box magazine. Normally, it uses these tripper clips. For a lot of you who are non combatants, and even those of you who are combatants who understand what the weight deficiency is when you start throwing more metal on your body and you've got to run down the road in this weather, and this weather is the worst condition really because you've got lots of humidity and lots of heat, the stripper clip is designed so that it engages the guides that are on the rifle itself, and the SKS is loaded by doing nothing more than pushing down on the ammunition, take the stripper clip, save it, it's like gold and precious, save them for later, you have a loaded arm, and all that's required is to carry the ammo in the stripper clips. With an existing chest pouch, it costs four dollars to ten dollars a piece, depending on where you get them and which model it is. How efficient can you get? There's an entire issue for one person. 150 rounds. If that isn't enough to get them killed before you have a problem, then chances are you don't need this right. In fact, it's more than efficient enough. Now, other arms will do, and in fact, don't think that just because I got the SKS here, there aren't many others that are available. We've got uh, AR-15s on hand, uh, Ruger Mini 14s. We've also seen uh, 1022s. Virtually any firearm will do if you already have a firearm and you only have a limited amount of money to spend. Be economical, but at least you have something that goes down range. As somebody said earlier, it's better than a butter knife. 22 a kilo. That's right. That 22 is cheap, cheap and easy to carry lots of ammo. Other features of the martial arm that's very important is that it be durable. <coughs> Most of your old military arms, one advantage is you can beat the snot out of it, use it as a club, okay, and when you are done, turn it around and chances are it will still work. It was designed to take and be used as a weapon. And so it's important that you remember that. And that's that little pig stick around the end is good for that mission too, of course, when they get in close. You don't want to. In fact, how many people I heard, two things I heard most common in the militia. Number one, I don't plan on getting shot. Of course, none of us do. And two, I don't plan on letting him get that close. Well, in both cases, chances are it's going to happen. And it isn't going to be your choice. However, we're not one of those people who says, fix bayonets and don't load the rifle. Okay? Close order combat is designed for one thing and one thing only. Don't ever forget this. Long enough to get what he has so that you can take what he has and use it because yours doesn't work anymore. It's not a Bruce Lee movie. 
In other words, beat the snot out of whatever's there, and then take his. And then once you have his, you can go on and do your job. Take yours along too, by the way. Don't leave it behind. You might be able to fix it later or probably find ammo for it. Beyond that, beyond that particular issue, the only other consideration is uh, spare parts in all of your arms. I can't stress this enough. Firing pin, extractor, ejector, and all small springs. They're not that expensive. They're easy to store. And we're trying to keep these things functional for years. Those are the parts that eventually will wear out with time. So they need to be replaced. One nice thing about this rifle, the firing pin, extractor, ejector, all small springs, and the recovery spring or tappet spring cost probably a total of $14 to $20. <coughs> so for $20, you've got enough spare parts to keep this thing going. You got any other components you might want? For instance, I'd also recommend if you want to buy a spare stock. If you're going to buy a nylon stock, keep the original stocks. You never know when you might want to go back. For those of you who have women or who have children who are younger, this has a butt extender on it. But these Chinese rifles are ideally suited for smaller people. And in fact, for anybody probably in the 11 to 12 year old range, or for the women who are who are at an average smaller in height and stature and. The women who are who are at an average smaller in height and stature and arm length, these rifles are ideal. So as a garrison rifle, the rifle they should always be considered. Another option is the M1 carbine, which is available, and in fact that's in the same family. I will guess another thing, by the way. This is a carbine. This is the Seminoff carbine. This is not the a rifle. A rifle, of course, there was another weapon that was designed bigger than this. A little different action. That was the rifle of this particular family of weapons. This is SPD the SKS. Yes, the SP, yes, the SPD. Then the AK was the assault rifle of this particular family of arms for the Russians. But this is a carbine. It serves a particular niche. I can turn around and make this thing into anything I want, really, with all the different add-ons. As you can see right here, this one will take a magazine. Take a screw in the bottom of it, see uh, this <laughs> For special missions. Exactly. Okay, now another thing are handguns. A lot of people ask us about that too. With regard to handguns, it's a close order weapon. Again, it's because they're too close. And I would recommend that even if you have a rifle, if you can afford it, you should have a handgun. Now there are two schools of thought on this, and we've got to make sure that's corrected. Some people say for every, ma every weapon you can carry, you can carry two more magazines. But if the weapon's busted, you can't fight. You ever try to make a handgun out of mud? doesn't work. So again, by carrying the handgun, you have the option for some form of close order weapon to maintain at least some engagement. In other words, participate in a battle if you are disarmed. So it's best to be carrying some form of small arm. Any caliber, any size, your preference, your, your, it's all determined by your pocketbook. I would recommend that preferably be a 38 Special, 357, 9mm, or 45. Those are the four basic calibers in the country right now. The other one that's really predominant because it's cheap is the Tokarev cartridge. And 30 caliber Tokarev is very good for penetrating body armor. In fact, it does a very fine job. For whatever reason, it's the original Magnum cartridge of its day. Other calibers are available. Other calibers are accessible. 380 Auto, 32s. If somebody gives you something for free, say thank you very much and take it. Which leads us to another thing we discussed earlier on the campfire while we are taking break. If somebody says, oh my God, they're coming for their guns. Buy whatever they're stupid enough to sell. Mm -hmm. Okay? If they want to get rid of it, that's your opportunity to get a hold of something that otherwise may not be available on the market. And we want to make price. That's right. You command you demand you command the price. We expected this to happen. There's going to be a point where when they make the weapons illegal, people will be trying to get rid of them before so that you're stuck with them and they're illegal in your hands. Okay? You'll see Galeos go down in a hurry. That's right. Everything will be available. It will be coming in with certain people. Not everybody, with certain people. I also recommend this as a, a seed to plant, since there's a lot of people here. Why not sponsor a buyback of your own? Ah, <laughs> 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 oh. uh, see, uh, I like the <laughs> conniving minds. I can imagine what we might acquire. And we won't accept everything either. We only want the working guns, but for a different reason, right? Parts two. Oh, that's right. Parts two. Up where we are, they're doing. They're not paying cash right now. What they're doing is saying they'll give you a food certificate or a shoe certificate. Well, all you got to do is offer them fifty dollars or seventy-five dollars cash before they get into the door where the food certificate is. And trust me, they'll give it to you. 
So you might consider rallying some of the troops, putting a little bit of a fund together when the time comes, and then using it accordingly. Oh, okay. Okay, very quickly, this is something we just didn't have as a prop here a moment ago. And it's locked up. It won't fall. It's got a pin. Uh, okay, it's got a pin. Oh, That's good. Not in violation of it. Six That's right. Twenty-two. It's safe. You should put a six-penny nail in it. Okay. It's got a screw in it. This is one of the Zeitzel nylon stocks. It's available, and it's fixed, of course, because we wouldn't want to worry about. But we want to worry about violating law. And why are so many laws nowadays? <laughs> this particular stock is nice in that you can beat the snot out of it. I don't want to scuff it, but you can run over it with a vehicle, and chances are, when you uh, after you do, you can come back; it'll be functional. They do not uh, are not affected by weather rot. They are very very durable with regard to uh, heat, so that when you are firing large large numbers of rounds through the weapon, supercharging does not take place, and the uh, device will not melt, or in some cases, the stocks that are wooden flash fire. So that should be considered also. Again, you can also make effective clubs out of these things. You can beat the snout out of somebody and it doesn't bend. Anybody knows what it's like to hit with a billy club understands how that works. That makes good skull muster because yes. points on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> there were several questions that were asked and we started to it and we started to answer but I think I'll follow through on with regard to the stickers. We're going to back up a little bit here now. With regard to the stickers that were found on signs, in most of the areas that we've seen these things, uh, they are leading up to areas where there are either military structures or there is original information on pre predetermined detention areas. In our area, we have several routes that we've followed to those sites. So keep that in mind. The uh, other thing that we have to deal with with regard to the camps is identifying all of their secondary sites and pickup points. That's why we have the weapons to stay out of those things. Also, if somebody is put into them, we plan on getting them out. We don't leave any patriots in there to rot. Another thing is a nice way to collect more weapons, okay? We always look at every attack as a way to resupply, right? right. It's not a negative incident, it's a positive incident. Now, with regard to the camps, there are three different types that we're seeing. Some are very heavily hardened, in other words, very heavily secured. Others are intermediate activity areas where they have double cord and wire. They're set up as the traditional concentration camps that you saw of Stalag 17 during World War II, etc. And then there are yes, yes. And then there are other detention facilities that are single wire, that are smaller compounds. Their mission is temporary holding for processing and sorting. Of the camps that we've identified, we have three or four that are primaries. We can identify sounds like almost 20 to 30 positively that are intermediate facilities. And the temporary sites are popping up left and right all over the country, and people are sending us reports in almost as quickly as it happens. Again, uh, Bob Dole probably said it best here just a few short weeks ago when they were talking about the crime bill. In the crime bill, it states that 10 regional detention facilities are authorized in addition to everything else that we know about. I do not believe that those are new. What I believe is that this is overt funding for the 10 sorting facilities, one for each region of the United States. Reconstruction. Reconstruction, yeah, there you go. I don't think they plan on, and in fact, if you remember, Hillary Clinton states that they want 30% reduction immediately in the American population. Uh, the, the Rockefellers and Rothschilds have said they want as high as 75% by the year 2008. So what we're talking about is they're going to have to come up with a quote-unquote final solution for the problem. In a hurry. And it has to be in a hurry, that's right. So what we're looking at is a direct threat against us. And again, as I said, if they're talking about 75% of the population, I would say that anybody here with the gray hair isn't going to be around much longer if they have their way. So we've got to protect them. I would say that anybody with a negative attitude towards centralized government's going to be so we're all on the list. Okay? With regard to the camps themselves, uh, though we'll go into detail quietly since we want to discuss this with some of the commanders, they're, they are not that hard to defeat. No fixed position of this type, which requires a limited amount of manpower to protect it, can be properly secured by an enthusiastic aggressor. If you are willing to take it, it will be yours. It's that simple. And the defender in most cases, as in this especially, cannot see a reason to effectively defend a site which to him has no real military value. In this case, he's a prison, he's a prison guard. 
Not a whole lot of motivation there, other than maybe to protect himself from being chewed up by you. Okay, it's that simple. Any questions? Okay, real quick, since I think we covered the basic points, we did discuss the chip a little bit, am I correct? Okay, so we discussed that. One of the things I want to do tonight, this is a quick piece of um, classwork, was to talk about uh, night vision operations. Just a real quickie. We've got an opportunity here. We've got an excellent opportunity with the conditions that we have. Well, I'm going to teach normal human night vision first. Now, remember, first of all, that every human being, in fact, of this group here, as large as it is, probably two of you have night vision comparable to many, many of the nocturnal animals. In most cases, one out of a million have what is called perfect night vision. Perfect night vision means they can literally see as well in the in dark as they can in the light. <coughs> Now, one out of a million, so we're talking very few. So it depends on the population group and what their background is. Your eye has, a, has material in it that's called element purple. Anybody familiar with that? Okay, good. What it does is it coats the eye and allows the, the <coughs> eye itself to expand and take in more light. Most of you have experienced the results of this. If you've ever, like I'm standing here right now, every time I look in that camera, you get this residual light effect. This is especially true at night where you have darkness as opposed to light areas. Element purple is there and is, of course, expanded to the surface of the eye over a period of about 11 to 16 minutes with your first adaptation when you walk away from bright light. White light burns and destroys element purple. Okay? That's, what, that's why when you come out, you step out in the street, you see these two lights come at you, you're blinded, it takes a certain amount of time to eliminate that dead zone that's in front of you. Each time that you burn off the element purple that you have, you're destroying more of the reserve that your body builds up. Every night, your body builds up a new reserve. You can enhance that by, of course, taking beta carotene, and uh, there are several other vitamins that can be recommended. They will help to enhance the production of element purple for the eye. However, in most cases, we do have technology available. But in, in, in the first instance, you are your best weapon. And in many cases, you're the only weapon you've got. Combat situation. Yep, combat situation. Batteries run out. People are all that's left. And in fact, it is your first tool right here. Use your mind. With your night vision, what you need to do, especially night patrols, for instance, peripheral security or patrolling, what you would do is, first of all, eliminate all these external white light situations. You've seen in the movies where you see a red light cover or a red light lens. What that's doing is blocking out the harmful radiation that destroys the element purple. Red light does not. Red lenses filter out the light. This light, of course, would normally be undone. Right there. I'd undo it. Also secure the others. Then I would block all of the internal areas of the house. My security elements would come outside, and you adapt them. In other words, you literally sit down for a period of time, covering the eyes, and allow the body to disperse the material that's needed to increase your night vision, your private night vision. Once that's done, what we do, of course, we're going to do it here tonight for a little bit. We're going to shut some things down. The next thing that's done is that you have to adapt people to use the night vision properly. Now, what happens, first of all, if you've ever tried this, you all know, but you just ignore it, the center of your eye is a dead zone. Are you all familiar with that? Yeah. Okay. The center of your eye is a dead zone. You automatically, and you've been, and from birth, you automatically defocus around that block. At night, you physically focus with your eye without a perspective to focus on or without an objective to focus on. Your eye automatically tracks to center. And what happens is you're trying to look at an, an object with your dead spot, with a dead zone. So what you need to learn to do is if this is the objective, you need to learn to use either an X pattern or a Z pattern when you observe things. Never look at an object directly. Look at it indirectly. You'll find this time and again it works. It's the only way it'll work. In other words, if this is the objective right here, you would move from left to right, down, and back, then reverse the order again, and or you can use a figure eight pattern. Some people like to do that. It works the same way. But by using a figure eight pattern, your mind will register this area that's normally dead in the center. This technique has to be used 
And you also have to protect your eyes in the event of white light illumination. Example is when you do see the car coming down the road, one of the techniques that you use is you decide which you want to use as your shooting eye. Everybody knows you have to line up sights. You have to observe and be able to identify targets. Some cases you've seen where people have realistically done this in theater, in the movies, when they depict war movies, where the soldier will cover his right eye when he's exposed to white light, like a mapping light or if a vehicle shines a light or if there's a star shell and you have night illumination like you see in the movies with a pop star shell. The reason he's doing this is because he's saving the adapted eye. The one is used for conventional vision. This one is used for abnormal or night vision. Okay? Another technique which is not as successful is just simply to close the eye. That helps. But you should turn the eye down and allow the skull and the overcrest of your, of your forehead to block the vision, block it out. You'll know by the, by the illumination of secondary light through the skin of the eye that the car or the vehicle or the illumination has passed, whatever it is. Flashlights, whatever you're talking about. Some people may do this accidentally. Other people are doing it intentionally because they're trying to find you. Okay? Illumination flares are actually designed to disrupt the battlefield not in, and not enhance it. So when you see all these movies where they were using it, the flares are designed to mess up the vision of the combatants. And in fact, normally, your observers will cover themselves up when the flares are being used, and as soon as the flares are done, they come back out of their cover, your LPOPs as we call them, their vision's not messed up, but everybody else's is. See how that works? When you're trying to attack, can't be sure when something's going to go off. So as a defender, you have an advantage. Now, if you lose the element purple, if it's burned off, it will take 22 to 25 minutes in most cases to readapt. If you lose it a third time, it will take maybe half an hour to 40 minutes to readapt. Because you've destroyed a specific amount of the reserve and your body's having to compensate and spread more and more of it thinner and thinner over the surface of the eye. All cost. American forces and foreign forces have become sloppy and lazy because we have these Wonder Tech toys. Okay? Now we have them too. Make no mistake about it. But before you can afford to do that, you must be trained properly to use the first tools that you have, which are always yours. Remember, best soldier is a well trained soldier. Well trained soldier in the field trained properly can defeat any force. If you need strength, it's capable of responding to anything. American soldiers are very intelligent. Some of the best trained for a reason. We expect you to learn. Nowadays, we seem to, of course, the New World Order policy is you aren't expected to do anything other than what you're absolutely you know, told to do. Do not educate them. Keep them simple gun sites, simple stupid gun sites that aren't capable of responding. We've got a good set of soldiers. We've got an opportunity to preserve them. We want to give them all the training that we can. Night compass operations are very difficult for this reason also because in most cases what you have to do first is identify your best night vision people and you have to test them. Once you've done that, you have to choose them as pathfinders, as your pickets and scouts, and as your tail men. The tail man and patrol is very important. Otherwise, when you do a head count, you might find two or three missing because if I'm behind you, you will. See what I mean? So it works. You've got to have people that are using their eyes. That's very important. The Gurkhas don't sleep. That's right. I don't sleep. That's right. The Gurkhas don't sleep. We don't sleep either. Another thing I'll remind you of. Bad weather is your fighting condition. The worse the weather, the more likely you're going to find me out there behind you when the time comes. Why? Nobody likes to get wet. Nobody likes to get cold. Everybody, every soldiers especially, love to complain. And when they're in their guardhouse, that's when you're in there picking up their supplies, when you're busy finding the weapons that you need. They when can't you watch you by satellite. That's right. Satellites are pretty much useless in those conditions. Don't work. Good. Nope. <laughs> I'll pass this around. This is an example of one that's available commercially right now. Now this particular one is a pot, is a full flare. Hot flare. Military ones, this one pulls, military configured U.S. are pop star shell type, okay? In this particular case, these are also good for air defense. At least it makes the uh, guys in the helicopters wonder what's coming up. A lot of people ask, gee, what do I do when the choppers show up? These are kind of nice to have a bunch of. Muzzle loaders are another option, too, of course, muzzle loading uh, pipes. You can use your imagination. They can be supplied in a variety of different ways. 
Go ahead and pass that around. Twenty bucks. Yeah, for twenty dollars you can have a number of these, twenty dollars a piece. I would also recommend, and we're telling all forces, pick up smoke. Yeah. Pick up all the smoke uh, smoke discharges you can. Smoke grenades. Another option is uh, anybody here into air conditioning? Okay, but if you know anybody who's in the heating and cooling or air conditioning, the cheapest smoke devices that you're going to find that you can pull and throw are air conditioning ventilation test grenades. Oh, yeah. Yes, they're about the size of juice cans. Some are bigger and will have more greater volume because it depends on the size of the system you're testing. They cost as little as 2 or $3 a piece. The smaller ones, which are the size of juice cans, work almost as well as a standard military grenade. They saturate an area and cover it. Smoke is a covering device and a confusion device. You are going to need it. They expect all dependents to carry it. In other words, two for each dependent. <coughs> Combatants should carry at least two, but preferably four each. Because smoke is, is valuable. It has, serves its purpose. Confusion on the battlefield is to your advantage. The nice enemy is organized. Too. I'm sorry. Nice heat too. That's right. And Make seat. That's right, creating thermal target confusion. That's another important thing. Also, before I forget tonight, another thing about our uniforms, this one's washed out, so I don't think this actually has the protection it should have. Most of our uniforms have a certain amount of thermal Im uh, imagery reduction material in them. The woodland camouflage uniforms all were made originally with this material in it. It takes two years, usually, of heavy-duty washing to wash the material out. So if you've got a newer uniform, chances are it has a certain amount of protection in it already. The brown underpants that you wear also help. Brown underpants and the military brown t-shirts you see today also have the same material. So that overall, you're creating a small thermal image. You can this, buy it, too. You can buy it. No, the material, yes. You can well, buy you can it. buy a spray, too, now. Yes. It's commercially available. You can wash your clothes in it or spray the clothes. When you're done, you're actually, it reduces the overall thermal image, especially from the material. This is a cotton polyester blend. The, machi the machinery they're using is just specifically designed to target this material. That should be remembered also. What we're going to do... Oh, okay. Clear guns. Another option, poor man's artillery piece here. Yeah, if you find any of them. Uh, flare launchers, flare projectors of a variety of different types up to 37 millimeter, all the way down to 10 gauge or 12 gauge. In this case, this is like, what, a 28 centimeter? Uh, 28 millimeter. 10 millimeter. gauge. 10 gauge, I was right the first time. Okay. Great. This particular one, very straightforward, simple, kiss, just like a 12 gauge shotgun, pop open, yeah, clump, boom. White, very white stars, Mark twos. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. come off the, the canisters, these are the, in fact, this is the star shell that goes with this, right? Yep. Very white star. Flare pistols. Now, again, these aren't necessarily rockets, but they do assist in certain situations, and you got to admit, if I do one of these numbers, you aren't going to stand in the way to try and figure out what I just fired. <laughs> okay? So keep that in mind. You're trying to maintain a confusion level. You can also silhouette it. You don't have night vision. And if your night vision has been destroyed, you don't illuminate up, illuminate out. If an aggressor is to your front and moving in front of you, fire out and behind the target. This is also true if you have helicopters. Fire up and behind the target. Backlight the silhouette. Everybody else should be ready to fire on the silhouette when it's illuminated. Boom, splat. That's all she wrote. Most helicopters are not, repeat, most helicopters are not flying tanks. Russian, <laughs> Egyptian, Persian, and those purchased by other countries that are American, they're all the same. With the exception of the Apache and the Hind, some armored Alouettes, and some Cobras have some armor on them. Got a full breakdown of them. I'll get yep. copies of it. And that's what needs to be done. <laughs> we'll pass this around so you can take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. You want to show the nice size? These two both have nice size. Let's see. Okay. You should look black boots too. I'll make sure have some nice size. That's phosphorus. It's <laughs> more dark size. Okay. In this case, 
these are uh, tritiated? Or just no, you know, phosphorus. phosphorus? Okay. In conjunction with your night vision, something that we like to do, if at all possible, there are two types of night vision, two types of devices used. Iron sights with enhanced other are with optics, which we have here. OEG. Beautiful for shooting in the moon. Okay. In both cases, optical devices collect more light than your eyes do. If your eyes are adapted using your personal night vision, this creates an even more effective and deadly device. The night, the night vision here is, of course, the night sights are based upon either tritiated material or, as in this case, phosphorus. It's illuminated with white light or even red light, and they will glow in the dark. Line up the dots, line up the target, goodbye. And it does help. Trust us. We've used them before. Uh, this in itself is a very desirable night intruder device, intruder, uh, intruder elimination. <coughs> Shotguns at night are very desirable, especially gas guns in that they don't sound any different from any of your semi-automatic rifles, whereas a pump gun, and I do have a pump gun here, but still, you can hear him when he uses it. Location. That's right, location. Once you locate, fix, fight, fire, destroy. That makes a lot of money. Well, initially, but all rifles do, so it's okay. Anyway, this is a 1100, pretty sure. Not an earlier model. Okay, 1100, extended tube. And it's basically a, a general house cleaner outer or a cockroach eliminator. <coughs> ATF hat type or otherwise. Nice. Uh, ATF, FBI, DEA, foreign forces, you name it. If they're, viola if they're violating the law, they need to be corrected. And this is one way to do it. <laughs> That's right. I'll watch this. Now, might want to pass this around if we could, or at least give everybody a chance to look at it. I noticed it had the adapter. That's why you were having trouble recognizing it as a Remington because it has a speed loader adapter, which is not standard either. Yeah. And it just loads it in seconds. While you're talking about sighting, uh, the Russian made uh, night vision device uh, called the Tech 2 uh, has both a handle for handheld use and a Weaver scope mount. If you turn it upside down, mount it on your rifle. And um, I have a, uh, a local source for those, a dealer who will be any, uh, any price on that. Guarantees the lowest price is in the uh, close, close to 400 bucks, which is a bargain. Uh, and and they're, they're now uh, taking American-style batteries, not the uh, Russian type rechargeable. Okay, they're taking double A's in many cases. Yeah. And some are taking nine. nine. Yeah. Very important that when you're choosing night vision, American night vision also takes specialized batteries, which are accessible but expensive. Then the Russians went around, and of course they stole our technology, and they based a lot of it upon standard AA and 9 volts. Gee, what a, what a novel concept, cheap to replace batteries when the time comes. So a lot of them do have conventional battery packs, and they should be identified as opposed to specialized batteries, which may be irreplaceable later. Night vision has a limited value, though, I will say this. If you're using it in a passive battlefield or if you use a passive collection system, that's okay. Remember that most of the Russian technology and even our own technology is based on defeating that particular technology. All the equipment we're using is designed to defeat our own equipment or the other sides. At least they're identify having, it. They're having trouble with that. They're explain how that one's used. Yeah. The point? This is OEG. Oh, we'll, we'll do that later. That's okay. Because we're all trying to figure out how to use it. We do have a device against our night vision, too. Made in candles to tell a spot. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, if all else fails, the poacher's, the poacher's delight. Yes, sir. That's right. White light illumination is effective against most night vision. The only problem with using it that way is that you become a target, too. <coughs> Remember, what goes out comes back. So in many cases, as with infrared technology for night operations, we're going to step away from here, by the way, and do a little, give a little class. We want everybody to try what we're talking about. Uh, with night vision especially, white light kills the photocell, kills the, uh, the cannon that's collecting the light. And in some cases, it will destroy it, depending upon its age. In other cases, it will simply shut it down. The iris will close. They can't see. Now they're back to your level and they've got to fight on your terms, and they don't have the, the technology that they've been based upon to fight with. They have to resort back to what you're already used to using, and that's very important. So anyway, any other questions? 
we get a chance, we're going to shut a few things down or step away just down the field here, I think it'd be best. We got a nice moon tonight, so it's not going to be that hard. One thing about a moon is, uh, for a hunter, that's okay. If I were defending, I don't mind a moon. That's right, all the night vision stuff works. But for operations like this, the, the moon is your enemy. So you re reverse your, your tactical operations to cycle against the moon. Illumination of any kind enhances the defender's capabilities and degrades yours, especially if you have to move through an area or if you have to escape and evade. Any questions? All right, that's it for the night. Oh. <laughs>